live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm Bettina Lawton, and I'm your host. And I am joined for this show by three newly elected members of the Virginia House of Delegates, Carrie Delaney, David Reed, and Jennifer Carroll Foy, along with the longest serving delegate, Ken Plum. We're going to talk about the just completed election, what led these folks to run, what they plan to do now that they've won, and where they see the House of Delegates going over the next two years. And of course, the headline news from mid-December was the one vote recount victory by Democrat Shelley Simons in the 94th House District over the three-term Republican incumbent. And it reminds us again that every vote counts. The House of Delegates is now split 50-50 between the Democrats and Republicans, ending what had been 17 years of Republican control. So on January 6th, the Northern Virginia General Assembly delegation will hold public hearings at the Fairfax County Government Center, so you can go and visit them there. And the General Assembly convenes on Wednesday, January 10th, so stay tuned for that as well. So let's get started with our first guest, Carrie Delaney. She is the delegate-elect of District 67, which is parts of Fairfax and Loudoun counties. Carrie won just under 58% of the vote to defeat the Republican in on November 7th. That was the first time in eight years that the Democrats have been able to win the seat. Carrie has served in the state attorney's office, was a communications director for Shared Hope International, and has her own consulting firm. So Carrie, welcome to the show. I'm Thank pleased you. to have you. Thank you. <laughs> so people in the district, of course, know you because you have been out there at forums and public events and door to door. But some of our viewers aren't in your district. So tell us about who you are. Okay. Well, thank you for asking, because um, I think the story of what led me here um, is, is definitely at the core of how I hope to serve in the General Assembly. You know, I started my career in the human service field. I began working with children in foster care. My first job out of college was at a group home for kids in foster care. And it was through that experience that I really saw just how much policy can either serve or fail. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was really what planted the seed for me uh, to someday be able to, to be an advocate for people at this level of government because I, I got to witness that firsthand that some of the policies that are made in state capitals really do have the direct ability to impact people's lives for the better or for the worse. And it's often our most vulnerable who we see uh, with the, the most impact. And um, having dedicated my life to you know public service and to being an advocate for others is really what inspired inspired me to run, you know, having worked with children in foster care, um I'd also served as a sexual assault crisis counselor um, before working in, in uh, the arena of preventing human trafficking. And so the work that I've done has always been about being a voice for people, standing up for people, being an advocate for others, especially our most vulnerable. And so having the opportunity to go to the General Assembly to address you know, the, the many complex issues that we face as a commonwealth, but definitely keeping in mind how do the decisions that we make impact the lives of the people that we're there to serve. Well, you certainly have experience in some hot button type <laughs> issues <laughs> these days with all of the hashtag me too going on and people both in business and politics and in entertainment getting um, being forced to resign because of sexual assault uh, allegations and of course the recent thankfully defeat of Roy Moore um, over in Alabama so you will be a great resource for people in that area I am sure um, so you decided to run to be more service in these types of areas. What did you hear on the door? What were your big issues? So I think that the three biggest issues that we heard knocking on doors, I mean, we're in Northern Virginia, so naturally transportation is at the forefront of everyone's mind. That is a, a nonpartisan issue <laughs> that uh, affects our day-to-day -day lives. People want to be able to get to work. They want to be able to get home to their families. And so addressing our transportation issues uh, was a, a huge concern to a lot of the folks that we talked to on the doors, a lot of the people that I, I spent time talking to, you know, we're interested in uh, looking for long-term solutions, looking for solutions that weren't just kicking the can for the next election cycle, mm -hmm. but really looking, how do we plan 10, 15, 30 years into the future? Uh, looking to focus on um, definitely expanding roadways and improving interchanges, but also looking at transit as a more viable alternative for more more uh, commuters. So did you hear a lot about the tolls on the, the doors? Because we've certainly been hearing <laughs> about it since they went into effect. Well, we, we certainly did didn't know um, the figures that we'd be seeing uh, on those toll roads when I was at the door 
members talking to people, but there were a lot of concerns that folks had about paying tolls on an existing infrastructure. That was definitely a concern that a lot of, um, of our um, residents uh, expressed. Um, what we talked a lot about, though, was you know congestion relief. And if, if we're going to be seeing you know the tolls happening on 66, there was an interest in, in looking at getting more buses, having more buses running um, on 66. Because if we're you know if we're going to have that uh, contract, a uh, contractual speed that we need to be able to keep that road operating, and that's right. part of what dictates the toll level is how fast we need to make sure that we're getting people into to Washington D.C. you know at a, at a minimum speed, and um, to be able to offer more viable alternatives to more people. Because even the commuters who feel that they need to take their car, if they have you know kids in school or daycare where they know at the drop of a you know phone call they need exactly. to they feel that need to get in the car and rush back and be there. If we're able to offer more viable alternatives to more people, whether it be metro, whether it be buses, we all enjoy the congestion relief. So making okay. our bus systems more viable, more reliable, um, more affordable, more, more accessible to more people having the opportunity to have Metro be more of an alternative for even a percentage more people, even the, the folks that are you know in the suburbs that feel like they're always going to want their cars, you know, we're, we're all going to enjoy that, uh, that congestion relief if we're able to diversify the way in which people travel. Well, and I did read something that said uh, by some person who purported to be an economist, I believe, uh, that, oh, this was the congestion pricing, those huge dollar amounts we were hearing about, it's designed to change behavior. This is long-term change behavior. Certainly people might take a look and say, well, you know, Metro might be a better option as, as opposed to paying this enormous amount of money because on a day-to-day -day basis, that's a, that's a lot of tolling for people going in to work for the federal government. It, it is a lot of a lot of tolling, and um, you know, I mean, I've got my opinions about tolling existing infrastructure. Um, at this point, you know, we're, it's going to have to be about finding solutions, looking at you know how do we solve some of these problems, and so um, you know, I, I think that uh, seeing an alternative for more people is going to be a viable way to relieve congestion, and um, you know, metro and the bus system is certainly a good place to put some of that attention. Right. Now, I saw recently that. Uh, in the last day or so that Governor McAuliffe has put in some permanent metro funding, but it requires more taxes, specifically on Northern Virginia is what I read. None of the details, of course, are yeah. there, but I just sort of highlight that because I have friends who live in that Tyson's tax district mm -hmm. who are constantly complaining to me about how they have special taxes in Tyson's because of the silver line coming through. So when I saw that he had some notion of more taxes specifically at Northern Virginia, I thought, oh, this will not go well. It, this is going to be a conversation that we're going to have to have, and um, it's I think I, I predict is going to be a big uh, point of, of conversation in the General Assembly to understand you know how do we prioritize Metro, how do we um, make the, the proper investments, and you know that that goes to you know what I'd heard a lot on the doors were making the investments in the things that give us the highest return on investment, right. and another issue that goes right alongside that is education, and that's mm -hmm. another big priority for me is uh, making sure that we're fully investing in our Northern Virginia education um, system. Our public schools are, are not only critical to offer the children the education they deserve. I'm the mother of two young kids, so we are just in the beginning of our career with Fairfax County Public Schools. Um, so I, I certainly know that firsthand, and I'm, I'm a firsthand advocate as a mother. I understand you know, what, what I want for my children is what we all want for our children and what I believe all children deserve. All children deserve a world-class education. But the other side of that coin is knowing that our local economy thrives uh, by offering some of the best schools in the country. Um, that even residents who don't have kids in the public school system a lot of folks that I talked to when I was out knocking on doors really understood that you know they, they knew that you know they, that the local economy whether it be where they work uh, the opportunities job opportunities in the community their property values were very closely dependent on the school the quality of education that we offer the quality of schools that we offer in this region and so education is is definitely one of those issues that you know there's a lot of us who simply believe that it's it's the right investment to make because our kids deserve it we know that there's a, a wealth of data that shows that access 
access to early childhood education and, and good educational opportunities directly correlates to later success in life. You know, that, that in and of itself, I think, is a, is a really good reason to be an education advocate, but also seeing just how much of an impact it has on our local economy, it, it is just the proof point that shows that making investments in education, you get a good return on that investment. Right, you absolutely do. So what are some of the things that you're going to address in Richmond in terms of these solutions? Have you started putting bills in? I know they're not totally do yet. <laughs> where are you in that? Because you just got elected. So where are you right. in that process? That's right. And it, 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 is, uh, it is a quick turnaround. You know, we, we do get elected on the 7th and then on the 8th you pretty much are ready to hit the ground running, holding meetings with people, getting to know, um, you know, how different groups feel about different issues so that you can consider legislation, um, especially, you know, taking into account things you might have heard on the doors because there were a lot of concerns that I heard on the doors that we kind of kept catalog of so that uh, on that next day we'd be able to start doing that research and considering what we might want be able to put in uh, for this coming year and um, you know education is definitely a big issue uh, I've got a few uh, different options that I'm looking at right now but one issue that I heard a lot in Loudoun County because my, my district is both Fairfax and right. Loudoun County Loudoun County is one of the only uh, one of the few districts in um, in Virginia that does not offer universal full-day kindergarten right. and getting on a pla on a path to make that possible I think is very important because you know as I'd mentioned there is so much evidence that shows that early Early childhood education is vital and a predictor of later success. And when you have kids that are entering into kindergarten that are already seeing quite a discrepancy between kids yeah. that have gone to kindergarten, kids that have, or kids that have gone to preschool, kids that have never been in a school setting before. You've got one group of kids coming in, they already know how to read, they know their letters, they know how to count, and another group of kids coming in that ha this is their first time in a classroom and they haven't learned their letters yet, that that disparity has already begun and these kids are five and six years old. Yeah. And it, it makes you not want to go to school, <laughs> I would suspect. If you're one of the folks who, you don't know the rules, you don't know about how, how you get to do things, you can't read, you don't recognize shapes and all this other stuff. That has to be discouraging to these these young people, and, and it, it's a bad start all the way around. So I'm glad to hear that you're going to be doing that. Now let me ask you: We've got just a little bit over a minute. So <laughs> are there? I want to know two things. Are there certain committees you want to be on, and how can people get a hold of you? All right. Well, I think um, you know, as as I mentioned, that the you know, biggest issues uh, facing the district: transportation, education, and also healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you know we will have to see how committee assignments go. But I think anything that is related related to those issues that are so important to uh, the people of my district, I would certainly love to have the opportunity to continue to, to be an advocate in that way. Um, I do currently serve on the Virginia Commission on Youth as one of the three citizen appointees. You know, I'll certainly be interested, if, if possible, to continue to serve now as a delegate, because uh, that directs, uh, you know, relates so directly to my time in uh, human service and child welfare issues. Mm -hmm. um, and if people want to get in touch with me uh, as, as we're transitioning into our uh, official office and everything. I'm sure will soon be available on the website, the state website, but uh, carriedelaney.com is probably the best way right now, and that's K-A-R-R-I-E-D-E-L-A-N-E-Y.com. Terrific. Well, I want to thank you for taking time to come and talk with us today. I know you are busy running back and forth <laughs> between here and Richmond and, and doing all of these kinds of things to get ready, so I really appreciate you coming Thank today. you. I'm so excited to be of service, and thank you so much for your time. Excellent. You made your house a reality homeschooling yourself on loans, color coding listings, and flushing every toilet in a 20 mile radius. If you can ace house hunting, you can do it for retirement. Get on track with tips at aceyourretirement.org. Here's to the things that can keep us safe. Those we use all the time with hardly a thought. Those that are silently standing by to save our lives. And now, those that we carry with us everywhere we go. Many mobile devices will now bring you wireless emergency alerts, real-time information directly from local sources you know and trust. With the unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know. Listen, I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you judge me for having a problem. No one is going to know that I need help. I need help. I know that no one is going to judge me for having a problem. I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you listen.
loves the Hefley family. Whether it's a short trip or a long haul. Estimated time, 47 hours. They will beg. You're hungry? I'm happy to provide. They will plead. Deep, Deep fried, fried butter, butter on a stick. But whatever you do, don't wimp out. Now you're talking? Make them buckle up. He can't hurt. Remember, safety first. Cheese curls. Second. Are you orange? We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome to Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm Bettina Lawton and your host. And we have with us David Reed. He is the delegate elect for District 32, which is Eastern Loudoun County. David is a decorated Navy veteran who retired in 2011 and a business professional with over 30 years of experience in strategic management, banking, global telecommunications, and the defense industry. He earned his bachelor's in political science from Northeastern Oklahoma State University and a master's in strategic intelligence from the Joint Military Intelligence College. We may be asking you what strategic intelligence is, David, but welcome to the show. I'm glad this is your, your maiden voyage, I believe. It is. Thank you very much, Bettina, for having me. It's really great to be here today. So let me ask you first, because I'm sure the people in your district know you. Okay. And they have seen you everywhere at candidate forums, at their doors. Mm -hmm. But for our viewers who are not in your district, tell us about you. Tell us who you are. So I, I really appreciate you asking that question because that's been one of the things that I think really very much resonated with the voters during the campaign. For those of who don't know me, I actually grew up very poor in the mountains of Rockbridge County, Virginia. My mother left home when I was six years old, leaving my dad to take care of five of us. And then when I was 10 years old, he realized that he couldn't take care of us. And so he moved us all to the Methodist Children's Home in Richmond, Virginia, wow. where I then lived there for six years and then was adopted by foster parents and moved out to Oklahoma. So I remember very vividly as I was a junior in college, thinking to myself, because when you're 21 years old, you can kind of look back at the last 10 years of your life and go, oh my gosh, I'm living the American dream because I had come from pretty much very poor upbringings to now being able to be the first person in my family to get a college degree. And that's the reason why I decided to end up going and serving in the Navy Reserves where I served for 23 years and then retired as a commander. So that's a little bit about my background. Well, that's kind of remarkable that you, you ended up going from what was really a very challenging beginning mm -hmm. to where you are today. Mm -hmm. So why did you decide, here you're a successful businessman, Navy career, why did you decide that you were going to run for delegate? So I, I decided that I was going to run for delegate really because of two things. One was that very reason my upbringing and my background really taught me about the fact that I had been given a lot of opportunities and a lot of help along the way. And I really felt that we needed to have somebody down in Richmond who was going to look out for everyone and make sure that everyone had those opportunities to succeed, both as an individual and as, as a business. And I thought that that was something that was lacking. The other thing is, is that when you spend 23 years in the Navy and you learn about putting both service to the community and the country above yourself, and I thought that that was something that we also needed in Richmond. Well, we certainly need it in a lot of places, not just Richmond. We're finding that out. So you ran on certain issues, and yes. I'm assuming that you did canvassing and did all this other mm -hmm. stuff. So what issues other than opportunity led you to run? Were they the same issues people were talking about at the doors? So that's a really good question because one of the things that would happen on a regular basis is that so much that goes on in Washington, D.C., because we're so close to D.C., would kind of permeate what was happening at the doors when I was canvassing. I ran on three very specific issues that were very near and dear to the hearts of people in the 32nd District, and that was the cost of the tolls on the Greenway, the cost of college affordability, and also the lack of full-day kindergarten for all of the children in Loudoun County. We're one of only three jurisdictions, mm -hmm. us, Virginia Beach, and Chesapeake, that still don't have full-day kindergarten for all of the children. So those were the things that I ran on, but it's really interesting that when you're going around and you're talking to 
individuals. I remember knocking on doors and, and asking someone, what's the thing that's concerning you the most? And this was during the time when there was all the saber rattling with North Korea as it related to nuclear war. And no kidding, somebody would say, I'm concerned about nuclear war. And fortunately, with my background as having been a Navy intel officer during the latter days of the Cold War, I was able to speak to that and address it. Not that a delegate can do anything about it, right. but I could at least speak to the issue. Did people understand that this was not a Richmond issue, that this was a Washington issue? They, they did. People understood it, but I really wanted to begin having conversations with individuals. So I would go and ask people if they knew about the upcoming election, and then I would say, what are the things that most concern you? And sometimes they would say, it's full day kindergarten. Sometimes it would be college affordability, and other times it would be those national level issues. But it gave me an opportunity to talk to them, to share their concerns, and to let them know that if they could help get me elected, it could actually have an impact on that national level message that we all now are seeing really has borne fruit. Well, certainly people looked at the Virginia results, and this was before. We're now at that 50-50 mm -hmm. split, which was very nice to hear about. Uh, people looked at this as a repudiation of the politics mm -hmm. at the national level, that this was something where it was an opportunity to send a message. Uh, and then they apparently did because right. we had an amazing result in the House of Delegates and of course we won all the statewides. Right. So education obviously is a big deal to you. So what are we gonna do? Because what I read about education is that the funding at the university levels, the college education that you wanna make sure is affordable. How do we do that? So that's a really good question. And, and the quote that I like to use, because I've asked a lot of experts about what we need to do, mm -hmm. and it truly is a multifaceted problem because you have issues related to state funding. You have the easy availability of money from the federal government for loans. You have the just the rising cost of doing business. And I like to say that if you go back to when Harry Truman used to talk about The Economist, they said if you laid all The Economist end to end, they'd all point in different directions. And that's kind of where I'm finding right now that you get all kinds of different and disparate views about what's driving the cost of college education. And again, it was something that I ran on and I'm very passionate about because I'm the first person in my family to get a college degree. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure that it stays affordable for everyone. And it's just completely unacceptable for students to be getting out of college and then be saddled with a bunch of debt. It delays their ability to be able to begin that American dream. And so it is something that anyone who will listen to me down in Richmond I have been talking to about and am looking at different issues and ways to address it. Some of those are the possibility of introducing ROTC like scholarships mm -hmm. so that nurses, teachers, firefighters and EMT and police officers would be able to go to school, the state would pay for those things and then those individuals would owe time and service to the state. That's what the federal government does for military, and it's something that I think that we can look at doing here at the state level as well. So I'm very interested in that program. I have a son who's in the medical field who, okay. um, in theory, has his student loans repaid after 10 years, but from what I'm hearing out of the federal uh, government, they're gonna discontinue that program. Right. So a lot of people are going to be left adrift. Is there anything that the state can do to try and help those people? I, I, I would like to think that there is. And one of the things that I like to talk about, and I talked about this during the campaign, when we look at the budget, when we look at the state level budget, that budget is about priorities. It's about the priorities for what we're doing right now today, but it's also, it should also be a vision of what we want the future to be. And I believe we have to be making investments in education because that is where our future is going to be. We have to make investments in education, new jobs, businesses, all of those type of things. So we have to look at the budget and go, does it reflect our priorities today? And does it represent the vision of what we want Virginia to become? So how are you, because co there's college education, but I also hear a lot in our governor elect mm -hmm talks a lot about how not everybody should go to college. If you want to be a plumber or a mechanic mm -hmm. or an electrician, you may not need that four-year college degree and that right. we need to have, and I think he focuses on our community colleges right. as places where 
we could become broader in terms mm -hmm. of what we perceive as education we should be supporting. Yeah. Is that the kind of thing that you would support down in Richmond, or are you really focused on university four-year accessibility? So no, and Bettina, that's a good question, because it really is the broad spectrum of all of those things. And, and, and again, at the doors, I would talk about this, because it could either be four-year, two-year, an apprenticeship program, or some type of technical training. And we have to begin that discussion at the ninth grade level. We've got to be sure that when students are going into high school, that they are presented with a broad range of options to say, you can be successful in any one of these different paths. Because there are some people, and I know this because I grew up in the mountains of Virginia, there are some people who like to work with their hands. A liberal arts education is not going to be the right answer for everyone. And so we need to make those people feel like that they can be successful from the very early days and then that they can then go through college, I mean, go through high school and then choose a different path. And there are all kinds of different options. If you talk to the unions, there's great options for apprenticeship programs. If you talk to the community colleges, there's great options there as well. So we have to make all of those menu items available to everyone and encourage them to explore those different options. Well, I know here in Fairfax, in some of our high schools, we have the academy, which does mm -hmm. a lot of that. And I think it's really important, as you say, at the ninth grade level right. to make it clear. I, I do recall the son who's in the medical field uh, coming home from his ninth grade uh, orientation at the mm -hmm. high school here in Fairfax, and he was appalled. He said, they want to know what college I'm going to. And he was like, this is way too much pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, you're walking in as a 14-year-old, and it's like, what college are you going to? It's like, come on, people. And, and you see, that causes other issues. That puts a whole lot of stress on young children about needing to be successful. Everyone then feels like that they need to go to UVA or Stanford right. or Princeton and everyone needs to get a scholarship to be able to go there and that might not be the right path to success. As you mentioned during the opening, my degree is from Northeastern Oklahoma State University in a little town in Northeastern Oklahoma, hence the mm -hmm. name, that's called Tahlequah, Oklahoma probably had 7,000 students in it. A large portion of them might have been commuter students. But I've been able to do pretty OK for myself. Right. And so I think that it's the, it's the ability to be able to go to college. And we need to be respectful of the fact that there is a diversity of colleges that also can satisfy the need for you to be able to be successful. So when do you start putting in legislation to achieve some of your goals? I know it has to get in some, the, by the first day of the session, January 10. Yeah, so, so that's a really good question because you get elected on November the 7th. Right. And then there's just all kinds of things that happen. The first deadline for being able to pre-file legislation was December the 4th. So you had to put in, and, and it's a great system because you can put in ideas and concepts and then the Department of Legislative Services will draft the actual bill. So I have put in, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 items so far that kind of fall into the, the buckets of certain things that, that I talked about that I was going to run on, three or so items that really talk about higher education, a couple that are to try to make things more business friendly for Virginia, and a package of legislation that relates to electronic vehicles and how we can actually make Virginia more electronic vehicle friendly. All right. Well, how do people get in touch with you? The, the best way to get in touch with me is probably th through the website, and that's Read for Delegate readfordelegate.com. So that's the best way to be able to get in touch with me right now. Well, excellent. I'm so glad that you could come, and we thank will you. keep our eye out and see how you do in your first maiden voyage as a delegate. Well, thank you for having me. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments. It doesn't really matter. Every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. Hey, did you know that 2.4 million loving cats and dogs in shelters and rescues need our help to find a home? Go to the shelterpetproject.org and search your local shelters and rescues. Go for a cuddle with your next best friend. Adopt. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it.
We cannot be bystanders. We can stop to make sure someone is okay. We can warn someone when their drink isn't safe. And disrupt the situation. We can. Get someone the cab. Or walk them home safely. We can make campuses safer for our friends. Our roommates. Our, our classmates, classmates. Our, our fellow, fellow human, human beings. beings. We cannot be bystanders. We, we can. can. Intervene. It's on us. All of us. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. When it comes to saving ah, money, ah, what? Period. Don't act like a baby. Oh, it's like they're having their own little meeting. <laughs> this is so humiliating. Be the boss. I'm the boss. What the? Mm. Power nap. You were saying. And make a budget. Let's get to work. Need a little help? Stacy, read back the notes. I can't read. What's it say? Create a personalized savings plan and get other tools and tips. We can share. You obviously didn't go to business school. At feedthepig.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm Bettina Lawton, and I'm your host. And we have with us Jennifer D. Carroll Foy. She is the delegate elect to District 2, which is parts of Prince William County and Stafford County. Uh, Jennifer Carroll Foy was born and raised in Petersburg, Virginia. She is a public defender where she represents children, the mentally ill, and the indigent as an attorney. She was a foster mom for eight years and started the Foundation for Foster and Orphan Children, a non Nonprofit committed to building better futures for orphan and foster children. She is one of the new members of the House of Delegates with small children. Uh, Jennifer graduated from the Virginia Military Institute in the third class that included women. She received a master's from Virginia State University and her law degree from the Thomas Jefferson School of Law in San Diego, California. She won her election handily with over 63% of the vote. So welcome to Inside Scoop, Jennifer. I'm glad you could be here. Thank you for having me. So I am sure the people in your district know you very well, mm -hmm. but for our viewers, tell us something about yourself. Who are you and, and introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Carol Foy and um, I am the delegate for the second district in Southeast Prince William and North Stafford. Um, I've dedicated my entire life to public service. I have been a foster parent for eight years and I saw some of the deficiencies in the foster care system so I decided to open a nonprofit to help find mentoring, tutoring, and permanent families for foster children. Um, I'm also a public defender where every day I protect the constitutional rights and civil liberties of some the Commonwealth's most vulnerable citizens, uh, children, people with mental illness, substance abuse, and uh, the chronically poor. So um, just becoming a delegate is a natural extension of what I've always been doing, which is being a zealous advocate for the people in my community and trying to improve people's everyday lives. Well, I think it's very interesting that you are um been so involved with the vulnerable and the mentally ill because that's one of the issues that we keep facing in Virginia mm -hmm. with the mental illness and we've got all this new stuff coming up with Step Virginia that by the by just has not yet been funded so you might want to take a look at Step Virginia when you get there because that's a huge huge dollar commitment it's a great idea for purposes of the community services boards around the state but mm -hmm. it does take a lot of money to do it so you've always been this advocate mm -hmm. and so you decided to run because this was a natural extension yeah, absolutely. Well, I always thought about what could I do next to, uh, to, to improve my community and what was happening. Um, but after the election, I knew that if Trump can do it, I definitely could do it. Oh. <laughs> and I knew that we needed to have a response and there needed to be a counterbalance to Trump um, and a lot of the misogyny uh, and homophobia and xenophobia that was coming from him and his administration and some Republicans who adhere to that type of rhetoric. So um, after speaking with my friends and family and my husband and consulting with them, uh, they said, you know, Jen, you're the perfect person to step up to the plate and to represent us in the second district and all of Virginia um, to fight back a lot of things that's happening and bring civility and decorum and fight for partisan, um, bipartisan issues that's going to improve every every person here in Virginia. Well, certainly Prince William County has gotten a pretty bad name mm -hmm. because of <clears throat> your chair um, for all of those sort of 
Trump attitude. So it was really absolutely fabulous to see you win by the margin you did because yes. it sort of repudiates that whole nastiness that goes on mm -hmm. that so many people associate with Prince William. So you do have that opportunity to sort of raise the opinion of, of folks about where, where you live. Absolutely. Um, Corey Stewart doesn't speak for all of Prince William County, and uh, his ideals isn't reflective of us as a community as a whole. And I do think that uh, the election, the most recent ele election, is a statement to say that we're not going to tolerate this. We are a place of inclusion and diversity. And moving forward, we are going to set the foundation to say uh, things that's important to us are everyday kitchen table issues, improving education, transportation, um, diversity, improving people's quality of life, and um, not you know, promoting hatred and fear into uh, politics and injecting that into the lives of people. So when you were running, are those the kinds of issues that were raised at the door? I assume, given where you're, you're representing, they had to be concerned with the education and transportation and trying to make sure everybody had equal opportunities to things. But what were you hearing at the doors? Absolutely. Uh, the top three things I was hearing was Medicaid expansion. Okay. Um, there were uh, multiple stories of people having to decide to pay their mortgage um, or pay their medical bills. And that's a decision that no one or no family should have to make. Um, also, people living in poverty. I heard a number of people who are underemployed or unemployed due to no fault of their own, and they're not able to bring home a livable wage. And so no person who's working should have to live in poverty. And so that's something else I heard a lot of. Um, also transportation, um, as you may know, Washington Post named my district um, in Prince William and Stafford, I-95, the most congested, traffic congested area in the country. And so that's something that was on the lips of a lot of my constituents about what common sense solutions are you going to bring to help us resolve our transportation issues. Uh, after speaking with VDOT, they agree um, that just expanding the roads is not going to be enough. Uh, we're growing exponentially in Prince William and Stafford, so we have to get really creative with our transportation solutions. So um, those are the top issues that I heard, and of course education, um, because we have so many students um, that are in trailers, and we have uh, classrooms without teachers or certified teachers or licensed teachers. And so um, making sure that I address education when I go to the General Assembly is also paramount. So I have to say I agree with the Washington Post about mm -hmm. your congestion, because every time I have to go down that way, I'm like, oh, how long is it going to take me to get through? But I want to talk about Medicaid expansion, because mm -hmm. you actually quoted in a recent article about that. There mm -hmm. has been what some people say is some wishy-washy statements by our governor-elect Ralph Northam about, well, maybe it's a little expensive. Maybe people, we should have different criteria to qualify. Or if you want it, you've got to get extra training and go back in the workforce. And you were quoted as saying, that you would prefer to see Medicaid expansion available to everybody, but that you are also open to different ideas. So Absolutely. what what are you looking at? What do you think needs to be done in that area? Because it's obviously a concern of yours. Absolutely. It's one of the top three issues in my district, and I think um, for all Virginians. And so um, Medicaid expansion is the, the, the bare minimum of what needs to happen. And so as far as other improvements that we can make, I'm always open to hearing ideas about how we can improve the system that's already there. Um, I think we can all agree that it's not perfect. And so any creative solutions that, that can be brought to the table, I'm willing to explore that and have those conversations and say how can we not only expand Medicaid here in Virginia, but also improve it and make it better. Okay, so that's going to be something you're looking at. And I guess we need to peel off at least one Republican at this point to do that with the 50-50 split. Yes, hopefully, yes. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and my hope is that now that it's 50-50, they would be more willing. Hopefully there are people on the Republican side who actually do believe in it. But given that it was never going to happen with mm -hmm. the, the prior Democratic numbers in the House, I'm hoping that some of them will sort of, you know, man up, as we say. Someone said one time, you never say woman up because so few people could actually do that kind of strength. Yeah. I, said, I love that <laughs> comment, but um, hopefully they'll come back and do that. So um, education, are you looking at education at the pre-K? Are you looking at universities? What's, 
what's your interest in there? What do you think needs to be done or what's going to be your number one priority there? Absolutely. So right now, secondary schools is um, most important and, of course, focusing on vocational training in um, high schools and making college more affordable, that's also top priority. But right now, our schools are suffering, especially in the second district, where we have hundreds of teacher openings in Prince William and Stafford because we have so many teachers leaving the teaching profession. They're taking their chemistry degree and they're going to make $80,000 somewhere instead of working as a teacher in our public schools for 40, 45,000. And that's a quality of life issue. And that's something I understand. And that's why I will fight to increase teacher salaries down in the General Assembly. Also, I'm proposing legislation um, for a survey to be done to um, establish how much our schools are underfunded by the SOQs, the standards of quality. Mm -hmm. So we can make sure that we, when we reformulate the formula for standards of quality that we are appropriating the correct amount of money so localities do not have to pick up the purse that the state is not paying and so that means more money for localities to do whatever needs to be done whether that's buying more buses getting more nurses or counselors or other support staff that students need um, but we have to fully fund education if we're going to adequately prepare our students for the global economy and so that's something that's really important to me and I'm going to uh, propose bills this session that's going to directly address that. Okay, good. Well, hopefully everybody can agree on it because it sounds sort of basic to me and I'm yeah. always surprised when people introduce bills like that and then they don't go anywhere. You're mm -hmm. sort of like, well, we can all agree on education. How can you not agree on those right? things? That's not a Republican or a Democratic issue. I mean, we all want our kids to get a good education. We all don't want to sit in traffic for two hours uh, every day. We all want to be able to go see and afford to see a doctor. So I think those are bipartisan issues that everyone can support and get behind. Well, let's, let's hope that's the case this time because, mm -hmm. uh, and I do, you've used the, the word bipartisan a couple of times. So how do you think that's actually going to work out with this 50-50 um, split now in the House of Delaware? delegates. Mm -hmm. um, do you have high hopes that this is really going to work? It seems like everything's going to be subject to negotiation at this point. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's all about compromise. And that's the art of negotiation, that uh, two people come to the table and you all leave without getting everything that you want, but you effectuate something happening. And so I believe like going to Virginia Military Institute, that really taught me um, how to get things done. Because at the end of the day, you can be in a room with no one who likes you and people who don't want you to be there, mm -hmm. but you have a mission and you have to plan and execute and get it done by any means necessary. So you have to put your political affiliation to the side um, and you're down there to complete a job. And if I'm ineffective and they're ineffective, then we're not gonna be there next election cycle. And I think that's something conversations that need to be had like we need to get things done um, set politics to the side and say what do we need to do for our communities and to move Virginia forward so I think if we have those conversations and everyone compromises a bit and people don't dig in their heels so much because I think that's the biggest thing I heard on the doors people said I'm tired of partisan politics and things not getting done in Richmond and so I think we have everyone come to the table understanding that we have to effectuate change um, I think it changes the conversation do you think it will put the, the recent uh results this year where we've mm -hmm. got so many seats the Democrats got so many seats do you think that'll put the a little bit of the as we would say the fear of God in the other side to be more reasonable I think so I think this is a message a message that there are things that were happening that Virginians are not happy about and that there needs to be a change in trajectory about you know, what issues we focus on in Virginia. Um, some Republicans may have believed that Medicaid expansion was not where to go, where there was a very clear signal sent on November 7th that we want Virginians to. want Medicaid. Um, so I think, you know, they're going to listen. Well, tell everybody how they can get a hold of you. Absolutely. So um, you could contact me through my website. It's uh, jennifercarolfoy.org. All right. Well, let's. You'll get a whole bunch of folks uh, contacting you, I'm sure, since you have you won a Republican seat. Uh, folks who felt sort of disenfranchised before will be knocking on your door, and I hope you have a fabulous time in your first session. And Thank you. I look forward to having you back on once you've you've gotten through it. Absolutely, anytime. All right, terrific. All right. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site.
In your new role, we help you help. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Okay, so what would you bring to my company? What do you need? I need problem-solving skills. I got through high school without a car, a phone, or a computer. No college degree, though. Not yet, but life's taught me a lot, and I'm ready for more. Well, you're not the typical kind of candidate that I hire. But you are exactly what I'm looking for. Your company could be missing out on the candidates it needs most. Learn how to find a great pool of untapped talent at gradsoflife.org. Places, everybody. Light check. One, two, one, two. Everything looks good on our end. And lights. Come alive with the forest. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm Bettina Lawton and I'm your host. And we have with us Ken Plum. He is the House of Delegate Representative for the 36th District, which is Reston and parts of Vienna. Fortunately, my part of Vienna is included in that. Ken has represented his district since 1982. He was unopposed in the 2017 elections. He received his bachelor's from Old Dominion University and his master's in education from UVA. He is a former teacher and school administrator in Fairfax County. And the Plum Learning Center in Fairfax is named after Ken. If you haven't been out there to check it out, you should go out. I went out when it first opened. It was so impressive, Ken. It so, is impressive. welcome back. The school board called me and said they were going to name a building for me, and I said, I thought you had to be dead for that to happen. And they said, oh no, we name buildings for living people. Well, so anyway. Heck heavens! <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was going to be a but prerequisite. That would have been a problem. I'm very proud of that. Uh, that would have been a problem. There. So you are the longest serving delegate, Correct. and based on what I have read about this in the papers, you were there the last time the House split 50-50. I was. So I was, what happens next? Well, I was there also when Democrats controlled the House very handedly, and then we went to this 50-50 arrangement, and the Republicans, over a period of time, got up to 66 votes. Right. And now they're back to 50. And I will tell you, that reflects in part the changing political mood of the country as well as local issues and so on. But it's not a time to be feared. In fact, I think it's a whole big advancement for Virginia. Too long we, when we have a party dominate the scene, that party then finds ways to manipulate the process to its own end. And there are numerous examples of how that has occurred over the years. Most recently, the talk and concern about subcommittees. Mm -hmm. We're with 140 members in the state legislature you, a bill can go, and a bill that I think is very important is universal background checks for persons uh, before they buy purchase, for, purchase firearms. That that bill could go to a subcommittee of five people, four vote against it, and it's dead for the season. Mm -hmm. With 140 members of the legislature, I just don't think that's the way the system ought to work. So when you come together with power sharing, you start to have to discuss the process because one's not dominant over the other. Mm -hmm. And it has to be a nonpartisan thing, not a bipartisan. It has to be nonpartisan to say what's best for Virginia and what's best for making the system work. We sat down and did that back in 1998, and we came out with a system whereby we had co-chairs of all the committees. Mm -hmm. There was a Democratic chair and a Republican chair. Ironically, that worked better, and if you talk to people who've been in Richmond during that time, and include myself, I will tell you, it worked very well. Mm -hmm. So you had a Democrat and a Republican heading a committee, and issues that might have come up where if you didn't have that co-chair arrangement that might become a matter of antagonism among you, you work it out because you're the guys in charge, the guys mm -hmm. and gals in charge. And so it, it worked well. I don't anticipate it'll ever happen when one party dominates the other. Political right. human nature being what it is, there's a tendency to dominate. But the voters have said to us, hey, we're kind of in the middle. You know, mm -hmm. We want this thing to be worked out. And I think that's a legitimate point on the part of uh, voters. I say to people now all the time, particularly our new members have been elected, we're past campaigning now. Mm -hmm. We're now to governing. And governing says that you've got to get your job done. You made all these promises, you made all these speeches, now we're expecting something from you. And I also caution people to say that, remember, House of Delegates has another election in two years. Two years. Two years. And at that time, the voters aren't going to say, well, how many votes did you get last time? 
-hmm. they're going to say, since you got those votes last time, what have you done? What have you done for me? Yeah. That's and exactly so right. uh, working together in a um, nonpartisan way to establish a process or procedure that is fair, and then you win on your merits. Mm -hmm. You go to court, and you know a lot more about this than I do, but you know <laughs> what the rules of the court are, right? Right, exactly. And then you win on the merits of the issue, not on how somebody might be able to jury rig the system. Mm -hmm. So who does the negotiating for the Democrats, or for the Republicans in this case? Right, and, and I will tell you, this is uncharted ground. There's nothing in the rules to define this. Right. This is a time when leaders have to come together. I was happy to participate in the last round of negotiation, and I hope to participate in this round as well. At that point in time, I essentially said to the Democratic leadership, I'm not going to go along with a stalemate system of where we don't come to some agreement so we can do our business. Others also took that position on both sides, and so then we entered the discussion. What's negotiable? What is it that we can get done? And in that instance, it was heavily weighted towards trying to make the committee system fair. Mm -hmm. So no one was taken off of a committee, new members were given c committees, the uh, committees were balanced in terms of uh, how many Democrats and how many Republicans were on them. There was an effort to make a geographic balance. And those are then just people who may or may not have a position, but people who assert a leadership role to say, let's make this system work. So as at sort of a very basic level, then, mm -hmm. we can expect to see, instead of those stacked committees where mm -hmm. there's one lonely Democrat right. and nothing ever comes through that way, right. that this we may have a more balanced approach at this point, sort of as if the I basic. Get, if I get in my way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, sort of like, how else could you do this? You can't say, okay, you get the militia committee right. and I'm going to take finance. I mean, right. You, right. You, you sort of... And, and so you can't. So, so the practicality of it takes over. Right. And, and we have to have a winning record of what we put forth. They, need, they have the same objective, right? right? So stalemate's not an answer. Closing the government's not an answer. So then uh, cool heads have to prevail to say there is a way. We know that from this simple uh, sense, but we also know it from history in terms of the last time we went through this, and we can work out a way. So you don't think, you sound sort of optimistic, you don't think that the Republicans will look at this and say, we're going to sort of dig our heels in, we got, as you put, two years from now, mm -hmm. the Democrats are going to have to defend all 50 seats. We're going to get them back, and, and that the Republicans will just be looking and saying, the next two years is a don't let anything really happen. Mm -hmm. You hope that they're going to actually try and govern. Uh, I'm optimistic from a pr practical perspective that they can't say that and get by with it because there are 50 of us sitting there now, <laughs> well, right? Well, that's true, too. Yeah, when, when there were 66 of them sitting there, they could decide whatever they wanted to say because uh, aside from being able to override the governor's veto, which they lack one vote being able to do, right. they could then dominate the rules. Now they have to consult with us to pass the rules, or they have to, uh, we have to consult with them to be able to get the rules in place to go forward. So you, there's no way that they can stop us when we're 50-50 that then makes it look like somehow we're at fault okay. when they're sitting right there at the table too. Uh, it's delicate, it's tense, uh, some uh, uh, anger and so on was expressed along the way. The last one I will tell you was incredibly tense. We worked our way through it, cool heads, heads eventually prevailed, and people recognizing that the public's looking at us, uh, we gotta get this done, and so I can't start off anyway other than optimistic and to say that I'm going to do all I can to make for a working situation. Okay, so tell us about the speaker, because of mm. course there was this article in the paper that I saw mm. that said a certain Ken Plum should be speaker because you're the longest serving delegate. But what's the role of the speaker? Yeah. I don't even know what they do. Right. Well, and I will say to you, it's not the oldest guy or the longest serving guy that gets to be the speaker. It's mm -hmm. the person selected by the majority party and now if we come down with an even split, we presumably could have two speakers, and I can talk about that in a little bit. But first of all, the role of the speaker is to carry out the day-to-day -day activities of the legislature in a coordinated way that we can get our work done. Mm -hmm. So how, what is, why do we call them speaker? Well, in order for a member to speak on the floor, the speaker, the member, must ask the speaker. You have to stand up and say, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to make a motion. And the speaker is likely to say, the gentlewoman or the gentleman has the floor, mm -hmm. and you can then make your motion, and then the speaker calls for the vote. But you never have a direct exchange among members on the floor of the House of Delegates. All the speaking goes to the speaker and from the speaker out to the other person. I'd like to ask the gentleman a question. 
The speaker turns to the gentleman and says, will you yield for a question? He says, yes. The gentleman yields. So you control the flow of the debate. Secondly, however, and actually probably more importantly first, you appoint to members of the committee. Okay, so yeah. that's where those get to yeah. decided. Yeah, you appoint to members of the committee, okay. and you, when you look at people and they have various interests and persuasions, you can stack them up mm -hmm. to have an outcome, right? Yes, you can. Yes, you can, and it's been done, and it's been true in the last several years. Or you can say, objectively, who could make the best contribution as part of a whole on a committee, 20 members or so on, so that we could have a good outcome, and you make those committee assignments that way. Beyond that then, as bills are introduced, they go first to the speaker, mm -hmm. and the speaker makes a determination of where, where am I gonna send this bill for consideration? Mm -hmm. An interesting point would be that when bills have been introduced in the past related to gun safety, the speaker looks at that and he sends them to militia and police. Right. We know they're dead on arrival. But it wouldn't it be interesting if the speaker sitting in the speaker's chair would look at a bill related to gun safety and say, that responds to one of our greatest health epidemics in the Virginia. And I'm going to assign that bill to the Public Health Committee. Wow, totally different. Totally different. Totally see, different approach. But it points out the important role of the speaker and how the speaker can influence the outcome mm -hmm. and why the selection of the speaker is so important. So how can you have two speakers? That's like having two bosses. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how would that actually work? Well, we don't know because we've never done it. But okay. that's part of what power sharing would be. And I've been doing some research on the question, and it was astonishing to me to look at a list that compiled by the National Council of State Legislators mm -hmm. to realize that over the last 30 years, there have been about 25 instances across the country where state legislative bodies were evenly divided. Mm -hmm. So we think it's unusual, but actually in history, it's not unusual, it's unusual for us. So how do you work that out? Well, one of the extreme examples from one of the Midwestern states was they flipped a coin to see who was going to be the speaker. Oh, now, boy. I'm not in favor of that system. <laughs> I was going to say, let's no. not do that. So, so what you do then, and what's been done in other states is that the two individuals involved sit down and take a look at the responsibilities and activities and figure out how to make a division among them and agree to that division. Okay. It can be as simple, I'm speaker this week, you're speaker next week. That would be a nice, clean way to do it. It could be that I'm speaker today, you're speaker tomorrow. There are various ways in which you can di um, divide up the assignment, mm -hmm. but what's important to recognize is that with both parties sitting there at equilibrium of 50, there's no motivation for a party to say, well, you be speaker. Right. No, I mean, that's absolutely not, right. Not going to do that. Not with no the kind way. of power that you've got there. No way. So as a consequence, cool heads, again, I have to use that term, have to prevail and say, we're going to work this out to make it a working situation. And we need always to keep our, our eye on the ball. And the ball is good government for Virginia. Well, that I think if everybody focuses on that, we may, your optimism may be warranted. <laughs> I think I'm just cynical. So, oh. but we've got about uh, a little bit less than a minute. So what's your top priority going to be in terms of, is it going to be the trying to do something on the gun control? Because I yep. know you're a big fan of that, well, or Medicaid, or yeah. what's your, your in the last 40 seconds? Here, yeah, well, we there's, there's a number of uh, outstanding issues that haven't been dealt with. For example, the expansion of Medicaid. We have given up $7 billion of federal money coming for Virginia that would come back to us, we've got to deal with that. We've got people who are sick and so on. So that, along with doing a better job at our funding of education and mental health, are among the priorities, and certainly common sense gun safety legislation. Exactly. Well, I look forward to watching this. Okay. This is going to be a very interesting session, and we'll see how well the Democrats and Republicans manage to do on cooperating with each other. Okay. For, as you put, the people of Virginia. People can keep that in mind. We'll be good. So thanks yeah, for thank coming, you. Ken. My pleasure, always.